Welcome to Show Studio, it's Paris Fashion Week and it's probably the show that people are the most excited about just because it's a real time of change in fashion and everyone loves a bit of coming and going, don't they, and some new appointments. And um, we're going to be seeing John Galliano's kind of his second collection from Marcella because we previously saw the, the couture that he showed um, surprisingly during London and now we're seeing his, his ready to wear in Paris. It's all a bit topsy-turvy but very exciting. Um, we're going to talk about the collection, but we're also going to discuss a couple of topics that his appointment and Marcello as a brand sort of uh, throw up. We're going to start by discussing the response to, to the appointment in general and, and discuss a little bit reactions so far to what we've seen there. Um, I also want to talk about media focus on designers. I think it's a relevant time to talk about that, given we've also had you know, so much media scrutiny of Alexander McQueen, sort of in light of the exhibition, uh, Savage Beauty, that's about to open. And obviously... For John Galliano, I think part of his decision to show his couture in London was to kind of show amongst friends in terms of, of media. And I think it's interesting to discuss if we have an industry that treats its designers with such kind of, um, yeah, such ferocity when it comes to media attention. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is um, deconstructionism and who's doing it really well, who are the pioneers, is anyone doing it really well still, is it over, what, what sort of what's going on in terms of, of that topic. Um, I'll shut up now. So I'll let everyone, our amazing set of panellists, introduce themselves before we kick off all of that debate and discussion, starting with you, Dom. Hi, I'm Dominic Jones and I'm a jewellery designer. Hi, I'm Dennis Williams. I'm a professor of fashion design for sustainability and the director of Centre for Sustainable Fashion. Hi, I'm Dean Kissick and I'm a writer. And hello, I'm Heather Spro, head of fashion um, women's wear at Central St Martins. Such an impressive title that you almost couldn't remember it. <laughs> um, I it's new. Yeah, I know. Congratulations. <laughs> Very good work. Um, I want to start with, um, as I said, a discussion of, of what we've seen so far from John Galliano um, and his appointment in general. Were we happy with that appointment? Is it a good fit? Anyone? Dillis, you're smiling, so you have to go first. Uh, no, as far as I'm concerned. Really? I, f I find it quite problematic um, because I think that... The House of Maison Margiela, from a sort of political perspective, from a aesthetic perspective, from a kind of um, the whole sort of notion of, of heterarchy and networks mm. and, and the, the sort of quiet sort of uh, communal aspect of teamwork, is so completely opposed to John Galliano, who is, as a creator, kind of has always has, has thrived and not thrived, which I'm mm. sure we'll come back to on this notion of being exposed mm. um, and whilst I think it's very interesting to have something that is such a stark juxtaposition I think that because aesthetically and politically and kind of um, yeah philosophically it's so different I, I do f actually find it quite problematic and did so that come across to you get it out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. did you see, feel that in the couture when you looked at the aesthetically yeah I did yeah um, just because I think it's, 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 it is very interesting when you kind of have a clash of cultures, but I think because of everything that's gone on, and I think that this notion of, of something that is very much about how a community creates things and it's done in a way that is quiet but powerful is at just such an extreme mm. from Galleon. And also, you know, aesthetically, you know, the, the, the way of working, the way of cutting, the way of thinking about the body and the relationship between material and body yeah, and maybe, and maybe over time um, it will find a place that becomes very new because it's such a, yeah. a kind of strange cross-referencing. But yeah, I, I do find it quite, uh, quite tricky. What's everyone else's take? Heather, what do you think? Um, I was saying earlier, you could have knocked me down with a feather <laughs> <laughs> when that was announced. I think it was a real... Um, I don't know if it was brave. I don't know if it was silly. I think it was kind of... A, a, you know, it was um, definitely kind of like this crazy plan for bringing these two because I agree absolutely with Dillis it, that, you know, they are diametrically opposed. You would never have said, oh yeah, Margiela, you know, they, they're missing a designer. Let's put Galliano in there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I do think um, Renzo is being kind of the puppet master. He's mm -hmm. he's he's saying, "Hey, look, let's see what we can do to really throw juice into this brand, to mm -hmm. really um, make something crazy happen, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 see where it goes." So, so you think it's kind of a, it's more of a marketing and sort of press? 
Well, we'll see what happens. Yes. They, they, don't, they just don't seem to share a lot of common ground at mm. all. So, um, it, you know, I can't imagine the margellification of John Galliano, mm. and equally, I can't imagine mm. the Galliano-ification of Martin Margiela as a brand. Mm. That's. But does that tie into a wider spirit in fashion? I know Margiela wasn't a house that was closed and then and then revived, sort of, by John Galliano at all. But you know, we see this a lot in fashion with kind of houses that have closed. You know, V&A is a good example. You could look at like, there are countless ones where they kind of get you know, almost. You could look at it the same with Scaparelli. They get their doors thrown back open, a new designer in. And you do kind of wonder what the link is, and, and I wonder if we've got to a point where the generation who look at this and are excited by it, well not even a generation, perhaps people who look at this and are excited by it, don't have that same sort of desire to see nods to provenance or nods to history. I don't know. And I think in general, like it's it it's sometimes not necessary to be too nostalgic and just to welcome change. I mean, I I was very. I found it very abrasive with Saint Laurent, mm. but so quickly I'm used to it and almost have forgotten anything other than what it is yeah, exactly. now. Yeah. And I mean, you just got to see what this becomes and see where it goes. Yeah, we were talking about it, the same thing this morning with Lueve, where it's kind of it's a similar mm. thing, isn't it? You know, where it's a is part of the problem though that Margiela wasn't, but then Lueve wasn't revived either. And you're right, neither was Saint Laurent. Mm. Like it's interesting to think about it in terms of. Do you think just people have a lot of sort of emotion towards Margiela? Do you yeah, think? and I think it's more than just a different aesthetic or even a different cutting. I think it's the philosophy that is so mm. different now, and and the philosophy that you know, Margiela brought a philosophy to fashion that was so greatly needed, and and almost if if we lose that and we lose that kind of sense of something that is you know it's, it's almost sort of a sort of a communist perspective versus the kind of dictatorial it's, it's the thing yeah. of, of of everybody that's involved actually having a part of it and being seen as having a part of it and if we're saying that by change we kind of are, are, are losing the philosophy then i i think that's sad mm. but then this could be new john as well like he's very much fallen from what he was. And yes, maybe this is a chance for. I mean, it'd be interesting, but I, I do think that maybe um, the, I, I can I, I understand this idea of going from something that's so exposed to being something that's that's mm. hidden. But I think that the idea of being hidden isn't about being quiet. It's a, it's a different kind of strength. So if he can kind of go from one kind of exposed strength to to this idea of community, then great. But I just I don't think you can change your personality. But do you know if you would even want to? Would you yeah. want to change well, your personality? I, I, I can't speak. I can't no, speak no. for him. But, <laughs> but I mean, the, the the trials and tribulations he's gone through. You would imagine he's physically had to, no? Mm -hmm. Like he's been literally to the bottom and is like politely, quietly trying to bring himself back up. Maybe. Mm. I do. Always, I think. I think it's interesting because I do agree with you in terms of you know he is a showman. Like you could look at. There's mm. actually we have it on Show Studio an amazing video of all of his bows from all the different Dior, mm. Dior shows. Mm. But then I do think it depends kind of how you see. I think what I find Marge interesting about Margiela was that notion of community, which you talked about. And I do think if you look at someone like John Galliano, and I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here, he was a great collaborator, mm. you know, and that was very important to him as much as I think there was definitely that ego. But I think that was almost of its time, you know, other designers, you know, Lee McQueen did similar kind of theatrical bows mm. at, at certain points. And I feel like maybe that was a, his a history thing rather than perhaps a personality thing. I do, I do think obviously he enjoyed it more than other designers yeah and and he thrived on it and it's just such an incredible sort of iconic designer because of it and so in one respect i think it, it, it's a shame if he feels as if he has to change yeah yeah it's a tricky one dean what do you think you're staying quiet um i think the house has been quite lost for a while so it's not a bad thing you know to bring in a superstar designer even if it's weird but martin margella hasn't been at the company for no one even knows really when he left like mm. it was denied for a long time it's I don't know if they ever put out a statement but he hasn't been working there for ages um, and I don't know I can't maybe you can I can't really remember recent Margiela um, collections that, yeah. I, I don't really hear people raving about it or excitement about it and but it's he's that not part involved. of the thing though going back to Delis's notion of it being kind of Quiet. Is that part of the thing that it wasn't like? Oh, this season, this this season, that. Is that part of the appeal? 
Perhaps, but I don't know. I don't know if it's doing that well. Is it doing well? I'm not sure. I feel like it's kind of it's trading on heritage. People are obsessed with Martin Margiela, the man who doesn't work at the company. Is just like it's kind of the name, you know. Mm. But what's doing well is doing well being owned by a big organisation and selling lots of stuff, or is doing well the fact that people have got things in their wardrobe that they have a kind of sense of pride over and know its identity. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't make much difference if he's not creating it. And, and also they're trading on, you know, a very small pool of conceptual ideas that he had. Mm. Yeah, that you know, is true. They, they, they're reworking and rehashing and the, the ideas when they first came out were brilliant. And, and I think probably yeah. 10 years, you could still pull things, new things out. Yeah. But had we given it another five years, maybe it would have gone. I mean, and they've still got the second line, which is very much old, old mm. school Margiela. It hasn't been touched at the moment. Mm. Mm. What, yeah. yeah. Mm. What um. would you have liked to have seen happen, Dillis? I'm interested in that because I think it is interesting because I kind of, I know where you're coming from and I think you know, there is that clash and I think the political clash that you talk about, I find interesting. But then I do look at the house and I, I, I do agree that they couldn't keep trading on those old ideas forever. So I wonder, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree that it, everything needs to kind of keep evolving. But maybe something that was quite radical from a fashion perspective, and I mean, we'll probably come on to it, this notion of speed and the amount mm. of collections. You know, somebody who could actually be quite maverick and say, I'm going to do fashion very differently, and maybe I, I don't show in the same kind of way, or mm. is it in the same, or maybe expanding and multiplying from the original kind of ethos mm. of, of being in unexpected places involving unexpected people. What, what might that have done if it carried on being that extreme sort of not anti-fashion um, exactly, but being outside of the system, somebody that mm. could almost take something and take it outside of it, the current system. Mm. I'd have been, I don't or know who, but... <coughs> or even there was, I did a little bit of Googling this morning, talk <laughs> of before he was appointed, Braff being invited but declining, complete hearsay, mm. and also Hader Ackerman. Yeah. Either of those two, I think, would have... No one would have been going, <gasps> what? You know, yeah. it, mm. it wouldn't have been quite such a big... I kind Shock. of get the Raf thing though because I feel like it's such a reference to Raf. It almost mm. would have been quite a weird fit. I think I, I think there is something more exciting about them getting someone who hasn't. Because I I don't think that Galliano like tirelessly referenced Margiela, whereas Raf Simmons tirelessly references Margiela. So it kind of I think would have felt a little bit weird. But I don't know. I think it's interesting with the with the couture show. The reason I wanted to have this up and just kind of continue to discuss the reactions because I think when it first happened it was no one was quite sure to, what to make of it and then I think the kind of the fixed narrative afterwards has become these kind of two strands one of them is kind of just this like rejoicing that Galliano is back like the last line of the style.com review was he's back everyone cried at show's end palpable excitement overwhelming the sense of relief so it was kind of does it matter if it fits or not he's back but the other strand of the kind of reaction to it has been this notion that you can see a lot of similar codes and that actually this shows their aesthetics gelling really well and that his references, you know, from the sort of dressmaker's dummies down to the faces that, you know, the masks that he put on the dresses rather than on the faces, they were actually, you know, the aesthetics had gelled really well. What, what does everyone make of, do, do, you, do you think that he'd made interesting attempts to reference original Margiela in it? Um, we, were, we were talking earlier on about, I, th I think it's, it's, it's brave to be sort of experimenting in such a public arena, because I think this, this was a transition mm. collection. He was finding his feet, and the fact that he was playing with lots of different kind of, of ways of doing that, I thought was, was interesting. I, I didn't love it. Mm. But yes, I'm probably the one in the, in the doom and gloom. Maybe I'll be quiet and let everybody else. No, don't at all. I thought it was full of youthful exuberance. And yeah. I thought when I looked at that collection, it felt like somebody really young yeah. working on something and kind of expressing something that they just had to get out. You know, so mm. what that was my kind of first impression. Mm. There was a lot of passion and a lot of ideas there. What did you think, Dom? Did you like it? I really enjoyed it. When I first saw the pictures, like I was like, it was just it, it was just as that style dot com. It was joy to see him back. Yeah. In as you kind of like get over those instant images coming through of like, and then you like, I don't know whether necessarily I think it was like a perfect balance between the two, but I really enjoyed seeing his work again. Like yeah. I did miss it. I missed it from from 
in the seasons. And it's hard, isn't it? Because in a way, going back to the conversation we were having right at the start, it's kind of like, what's he to do? You know, he doesn't own mm. his own name anymore, so he can't kind of set up, he can't mm. be John Galliano. So it's kind of like, what does he do? He's always going to have to and, go to somewhere. And where would he go? Like, I mean, he. Yeah. They're not going to give him somewhere back at LPMH, are they? Well, there was Isn't talk, it? apparently he was offered Oscar de la Renta, which that okay. big New York Times piece yeah. about the new Oscar de la Renta changes, but he wanted to bring his team, whereas the Oscar de la Renta crew were like, we're quite happy with the team we have here. So I think there were other opportunities for him, but I think you are right, where would he go? It is a tricky one. Yeah, he was definitely coming back though, like you could feel it. If mm, it wasn't yeah. here, just mm. be somewhere yeah, else. I mean, could be anywhere really. Do you th- that do was you always going to happen. Yeah. Like you I can mean, really feel it, and it's surprising it took that long. Yeah. Um, just like narr- you know, everyone loves a narrative arc. Fashion's great at these. Yeah. Um, but I do kind of, of think that he was quite lucky to have Anna pushing him so hard to come back. I think mm. there was quite a lot of like behind the scenes, like back, back fighting. I think she lost quite a lot of personal relationships by pushing oh, so really? hard. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, d- I don't think it was that from an industry perspective that. Uh, happily. You said to me, interesting, you said you know, he was always coming back, it kind of doesn't matter where. What do you mean by that? Do you mean that actually, you know, kind of what we were saying before, that actually oh, it doesn't really matter who's where and what name they're designing under? Like, No, I, I'm, of, of course it matters, but <clears throat> just he would have got a big job. That's all I really meant by that. And you can really feel he had this great fall, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. People like wash their hands of him a bit. Um, then you can feel like the temperature change, just even just like in the press and everything. You can feel clearly the moment had come, it would be acceptable to interview him now, it would be acceptable to say he's great, sing his praises, mm-hmm. offer him a job. He almost went on this like wilderness years, mm. like interning at Oscar de la Renta. It's like this strange form of fashion penance mm. almost. or going to Russia to work for some perfume house or something. Mm. You know, he went through like the motions you have to go through. Mm. Go back to be an intern and then you'll be allowed to yeah, come back and take story, over, take it, over yeah. Margiela or something. Intern hard enough and you'll get there in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Do we, um, does everyone deserve a second chance? I think if you try hard enough, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, th- I think one of the, th- I think he did definitely try hard enough. I, th- I really do think so. But I do think as well, like, it, I don't think it was necessary, I don't, I don't necessarily think it was definite that he was going to come, well, it, I'm glad that he did come back from a bit, but it was quite a hard thing to come back from, because, like, people always talk about the fall and him personally, but, like, I guess the consequences, not just of, like, him personally, of, like, of what he, of, of the impact on LVMH and the people working there, and, mm. like, that, like, the money they must have lost from that. Yeah. Like, the, the, like, the actual, like, financial and like jobs and all of the implications it's much more than just him yeah that he impacted and I uh, and I, that's why I was quite surprised why he's showing in Paris this time because mm. it kind of made didn't make that much uh, after he sh- showed in London with the couture like I, I got that like I could understand why he'd want to distance himself personally from it but it kind of was in my mind it seemed strange that then he'd show the ready to work mm. in Paris. I guess maybe a bit isn't just that you talk about money there because I think maybe that is just a, a routine and a systems mm. thing. You know, shows are so expensive, and mm. I think the couture thing. I think you, they could probably justify a one-off because I think the press that they probably got from it like mm. paid for that show time oh, and that time just again. Be a one, mm. one-off. I'm not sure. I don't think they've decided, as far as yeah. I'm aware. I mean, I'm not sure. I don't know how sustainable it would be to consistently show like that. Yeah, but but then. Uh, he gave a quote to the US interest. Vogue where he said that he did it because he wanted to kind of show amongst friends and I think a part of it was just I think it was very smart showing removed from the rest of the couture week um, because mm. it, it did kind of prevent design comparisons mm. which I think was quite interesting the focus was all on this and it wasn't you know when you're watching like the Dior sh- like a couture show or the Chanel couture show you do inevitably draw comparisons and you look at kind of a an emotion of the season. I feel like this was kind of analysed outside of that, which I think was part of the intelligence of it. And it is a very powerful thing to be able to actually break free yeah. the system. And, and I think that was, 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 was great to see that he, he did have both the ability and the confidence and it was, it was received in that way mm. of being able to do it in a different way. Um, and yes, I, I, I think people should have a second chance. Mm. Um, it's hard, isn't it? Because I think, um, and this kind of takes us to the second point about media focus on designers, it's hard because, Dom, you kind of implied this, whatever he 
does. It, like, I, I kind of looked at it the day that he was showing. I went and bought all the papers and I looked at mm. how they were covering it and all of them, were, every headline was like, you know, fallen designer returns or like shamed John Galliano yeah, back. so quick to use newsprint anymore, would really. But yeah, exactly, that's the, no, you definitely won't be. <laughs> um, but I think that's the thing that's scary about it is you do think, you know, this will always be part of his narrative in the way that like, I was, I've been thinking a lot about it with the McQueen thing. Um, every single McQueen article has been like, you know, East End boy done good. It's like, you know, that just it's people have this narrative that becomes a part of them. And no matter how kind of offensive it is in the way that the McQueen's one is really strange, that obsessive focus on class. But with this, you know, every review will cite this and people will draw controversy out of design details. They will draw, you know, and it's hard, isn't it? Because you do kind of think it's brave of him to want to re-enter that system and re-enter that scrutiny. Um, but is that deserve it? Is it important that we don't kind of brush over it and forget it? Yeah, I don't think you should forget it. I mean, a, as much as I'm happy to have him back and as much as I've always wanted him to, like, and he was clearly in a really bad state, the choice of words, like, are ones that you should, they should be brought up. They, yeah. Like, you, many people have, have horrible breakdowns, but the, the, the things that he said were really mm. appalling and I, do, I, don't th I don't think they're things that should be easily forgotten. I think he should be welcomed back having gone through a mm. transformation and, and penance and he deserves a second chance, but I do think it should be brought back. Though, I mean, what he said was horrific. Yeah. Even if they weren't his words, they were still horrific words. But I think it's really hard, isn't it? Because I was thinking about this a lot recently. And, then, and it, to say, people do say they weren't his words, they weren't that wasn't John, but they have to come from somewhere. Yeah. Like, like, they don't just fall from nowhere. Yeah, no, you're right. It's difficult though, isn't it? Because I think there's the notion of like, he said all that stuff, mm. but then it's like, there's a lot of unsaid stuff in fashion that is equally as offensive. And Completely. I think that's one thing that I struggle with a bit. It's almost like a really good story. And I think, you know, fashion should be held up and, um, and challenged and kind of you know, spotlighted and scrutinized. But then I do think, you know, the obsessive focus on this, while no one focuses on the, like, I don't even know, like, I love him as a designer, but like, Raph Simmons' obsessive use of white models and mm -hmm. Prada's obsessive use of white models and mm -hmm. Celine's like, obvious racism. And it's kind of really strange mm -hmm. that... And that thing of, of what's said and what's not said, I think that, that it can be a really positive thing to keep talking about it if it's part of a bigger mm -hmm. conversation about yeah. the stress on designers, about issues to do with inequality. And I think it is, I think it's better for things to be out in the open and spoken mm. than, as you say, to be kind of there but not really spoken about. And it's the same thing, whether it's racism or, you know, what, what happened with the Chelsea guys on the train. Yeah. But actually, sometimes you kind of have to talk about these things. But it's interesting that the discussion around him hasn't extended to a conversation about whether fashion is institutionally racist. The whole discussion has been about, like, him having a meltdown as a person. No one's been like, this is, you know, but there is well, a that's because it was such here. a it was those, the words that he said were so powerful like it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a broader picture it was a very specific picture yeah but that's where the media should be we should have taken it yeah, yeah they should yeah. definitely be taking it there yeah. yeah and do we think that the media focus on designers is i mean it's only getting worse isn't it? it's interesting with the all the mcqueen stuff like how that exhibition has just kind of caused this like torrent of absolutely kind of like just bizarre articles about his personal life and these kind of two big books, the Dana Thomas one and, mm -hmm. and I think it's Andrew Wilson, the other one. Um, you know, are we the mentality that, yeah, they put themselves in the public eye, designers deserve that kind of scrutiny. What do we think? It's interesting, um, you know, we're not really in the age of the supermodel anymore, mm -hmm. that kind of obsession with supermodel characters. But in a way, it's transferred to designers a bit. People are obsessed with these huge designers, their lives, scandal, mm. which is interesting, it is kind of exciting, mm. even the terrible yeah. things that happen, it's kind of, it's exhilarating. Um, and like, you know, Conan McDowell would always say, he'd always talk about like the big four from Britain, right? And it would just be like John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, Vivian Westwood, someone else I can never, mm. maybe Paul Smith or someone, but you know, he was, he'd talk about this all the time and trumpet and John Galliano, is like for Britain, if you're British, he is like this superstar mm. British designer. I wonder kind of if all that's people left. know his name than know the name Margiela. I was thinking about that. Well, who is more famous and who's older as well? I was wondering about this. Margiela is older. Okay. Yes. 
I'm 100% sure, but maybe not. Can you check? Is Martin Wonder older that's than... <coughs> that's part of the weirdness of it, is that, yeah. you know, they're both alive. They're probably similar ages-ish, you know. They're both really famous. Mm. But do you like think that that, that, that that scrutiny is fair? Do you think that just because... I think it's interesting you draw on that Colin example, because I think Colin does talk about the big four, but I think he talks about them in terms of, like, influence in the way that we would talk about, like... You know, the most important designers at the moment are, you know, Raph Simmons, um, Phoebe Philo, perhaps like, you know, Nicholas Gesquier. It doesn't mean that they're kind of celebrities. It just, I think it's more in terms of design influence. I, I mean, I, I think that... Martin Marshall is three years older than John Gallion. <laughs> <Gilliard. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I think so much of it has got to do with business and branding. You know, the, the, you, you have a, a designer uh, whether they're employed by a company or whether it's their own, you know, design house, uh, so much is relying on them as a commodity. How they behave, where they go, where they're, you know, whether where, where they're seen and how they're behaving, because that's going to sell the perfume, the t-shirts, mm. the money-making things. They have to put, they have to pour themselves into these collections, which are kind of artistic expressions that everyone can, oh, wow, or oh my god, that's disgusting, you know, but that create mm. emotion in the kind of Twitter sphere and that mm. kind of thing, um, in order that. Joe Bloggs, ordinary person, gets to know their name and then when they're standing at the makeup counter or they're standing looking mm. at they they want to buy into that brand because mm. that person is seen, you know, more and more, I think. And that's you know, mm. let's talk about celebrity designer, you know, mm. more and more celebrities are being used to promote kind of designs mm. to, to the But can you remove the yourself from that? You know, somehow Phoebe Philo doesn't court press attention and I think no, but, but people that but buy Celine or would or want to buy into Celine like her lifestyle. They like the quietness. Mm. They like the, the the kind of almost um, uh, anonymous family. Mm. You know, they like that. They, they buy into her qualities. I think, and 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 that will make them spend. I don't know a thousand pounds on a jumper because when they're wearing it, it, it gives them a sense of self. So you think it's still just as much about personality? Yeah, yeah even if it's mean. really, really quiet. Yeah. That's, I think, why. Because it's because so much money is being gambled on these people's decisions. Mm. That's why, you know, we, we th kind of throw them out with great PR stories. And then they're not necessarily as protected as they should be. Mm. <laughs> What's your take on it, John? Uh, like this... We have a huge, like, huge industry that's worth loads and loads of money that's built around mere mortals, like, mm. and, like, it's, it's, like, each one is, in, is an individual and each one has its faults and it makes its own mistakes, like, Phoebe Philo and John Galliano are completely different people, mm. just as, like, any, any of them are, and, like, especially with the really emotive creatives, like, like John is, it's, like, it, it's, you have this man who, and in the, like, Alexander Fury said in the Couture Roundup, like, he's supposed to have created 35 collections in the four years that he's been missing. Like, that's mm -hmm. insane. Yeah, that's and you have this, like, hamster wheel where these people are just, like, non-stop creating mm -hmm. and not just, not just making clothes. For him, he wasn't just making clothes, he was creating, he was emotive, he was, like, putting his heart and soul into things. And it's, like, it's just not necessarily a sustainable or healthy place for anyone that has real passion. Mm -hmm. And it's... You, you, it kind of sifts the wheat from the chaff mm. in a really horrible way. But does it sift, sift the wheat from the Well, chaff yeah, because if you look now, like if you look at the ones that are succeeding now, they're not, they're not John Galliano's, especially as, as the economy has changed and the things have got harder in the five years, mm -hmm. four years that he's been. Like, I do think the rise of the people that are now are very different to, to those kind of like theatrical, like emotive designers that that have like fallen yeah. in its way. But then it's interesting as a case there I went to see the new that I think it's called Dior and I that amazing mm. Dior documentary film they were doing some previews of it and it's and it's kind of about Raph Simmons and that eight weeks to cu cur mm. creating his first Dior couture collection and it does completely illustrate the point mm. you say about it all being individuals because it's like mega brand Dior mm. and then you see it happening and it's kind of Raph uh, Peter you know his right hand man the woman that's in charge of 
um, the dressers and then the woman that's in charge of the tailoring and it's kind of those four little yeah. people just making it all happen but I do I looked at him and he's such an emotional designer Raph Simmons you know, he's like yeah. always crying and he's absolutely adorable he's very emotional and I kind of looked at him and I thought you know I know as you say everyone's everyone's an individual so it's very hard to like talk about them as case studies yeah. But I do think he is a very, very emotional designer who pours his everything into his collections, perhaps not a showman in the way that McQueen and Galliano were, but he's managed to make it work. But even if you're not an emotional designer, it's still like, it's a relentless way to be a creative. And it's a, it's a really like, I mean, even the strongest designers, like you, you constantly, if you have one season that's like, you're, you have a slight issue with, your like, your recovery time is like, a matter of months yeah. and god forbid you have something external to your work that happens it just yeah. it just like it's it's really harrowing mm. to like have to just forcibly pick yourself up and go through and it's like you just you've, you're indebting yourself to this future that is c- getting larger and larger and larger which is i kind of think what happened with john like mm. Yeah, just had to keep going, but kind of couldn't. Yeah, keep completely. Going. And I like, I mean, I, autobiographically, I've had, I've had, I've got myself into right like horrific states where I, in retrospect, I should not have allowed myself get, to get into for work or anything. Yeah. And like, I, I didn't have to look after that amount of work. But it was because of that seasonal. Yeah, pressure. because of that seasonal thing, and then uh, like, like, deaths and problems yeah. and like things that are external to work it's like you literally by the time you recover from making one collection you have like one month and that's about enough time to like pick yourself back up again yeah. and then you're designing the next one whilst thinking about the pre-collections or yeah. diffusions or anything else that's going on it's just it's 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 a really mm-hmm. mental way to like be a creative or a creative. be an art god forbid you're an artist and a yeah. creative mm-hmm. Yeah. So the thing that you're actually being celebrated for, or the the reason why you've got there in the first place, is then completely stripped completely. away, and you have no time to celebrate. You don't. You, you yeah, never yeah. have a moment to give yourself a pat on the back and like actually enjoy the work you've created. Yeah. And or you and, and you aren't remembered, and you in your own mind, you're, or like in it, or even in the industry, you're not remembered for your best moments. You're remembered for the moment. Mm-hmm. 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 And I think it is interesting <coughs> to think about the designers that are succeeding at the moment. You know. I think the young designer who's the most successful at the moment is J. W. Anderson, mm. and he is, you know, a business guy. You know, he's yeah, he is creative, obviously. He's you know, talented, but his his skill is, you know, he he calls himself a creative director. He doesn't even call himself a designer, and his skill is very, it's very based on numbers. It's very based on business, and I think it's I think it is interesting to think of the really kind of you know medium culture. We talked about them a lot this season, so I don't want to kind of continue to <laughs> go over them. But they're a really good example of that where it just literally could not make it work in a system that is meant to be about exactly what they are which is you know inspiring ideas a new way of doing things designing that in a way that offers you know the people that wear it a chance to be a kind of not a better version of themselves but a more liberated version of themselves but they, they literally can't operate within a, within the system mm. what's the answer because it's not it's going to you on sustainability <laughs> it's not very sustainable is it? no because this this idea of of being able to be creative and to be um, beyond something that's just about a commercial gain um, and yes fashion is you know, m- most of it it's it's something that's worn on the body that's exchanged through cash or whatever but it shouldn't be the the sole reason for it it's actually that's kind of missing the point and and, and more and more I think we we're, yeah we're stifling the creativity and stifling the risk taking it's happening whether it's for designers but also for students in education because with the debts they're incurring with the speed of things with the, everything that's kind of going on I, I, I and maybe it's just kind of uh, my own perspective but this notion of speed meaning you can't actually take the risks you can't can't go wrong it's got to kind of just be churned out mm. you can't possibly Take the take the sort of the other route of, of trying something differently, just because you can't you can't afford for it to lose. Mm. Um, and I think somebody like John, who's who's had to just be squeezed in that way, um, that's why I think you know coming back to this notion of him being in a house where actually it's, it, he's he's now being asked to to churn stuff out again. Mm. Um, and I think that's just a real shame for somebody who kind of yes, as you said, one of the great four. Um, for us to be able to celebrate and him to be able to do something in a, in, in, a, in a different way that isn't just part of the system and having however many 
collections being churned out. Hopefully, we, we should start to celebrate people that are beyond that. But are we being a bit, you know, I know choice is slippery, but are we being a bit like, oh, designers are forced into this system. Like, you can remove yourself from it. Like, a liar removed himself from it. I know he's but a liar. I was going to say, and how many liars are there? completely different yeah. to now. Like, I, I defy you to to go and start a brand tomorrow <laughs> and try and work outside the system. I do you not will think not, I can start you, a brand. You will not succeed. But and then if you think someone like Gareth Pugh, I, I was talking to him this week, I interviewed him this week, and he talked about... I think it comes down to ambition in a way, and I'm not, I am playing devil's advocate mm. and I've never had my own brand, so it's very easy for mm. me to sit here and say this. But he talks about how there's you know, a lot of greed in this industry and people are always trying to kind of achieve certain things. And he kind of, I, I took it as he kind of, I think he had this moment where he was like, actually, the yardsticks of success, he kind of got tied up with a little bit in the way that you would because it's told, you're told mm. that's what you have to do. And then he kind of woke up and realized what he had. Mm. Which is, you know, not having that much money, creating collections, you know, in a very kind of the way that young designers work, you know, even ten years in, he was like, That's better than what I could have and, and granted he's not completely removed himself of the system, he's still showing seasonally, but he has kind of made that active decision to not strive for all the things you're told mm. to strive for. Whereas John Galliano is actively putting himself back into a system. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's easy for me to say. But Gareth does have a lot of support. Yeah, he has yeah. a lot of support, and and the thing yeah. is, it's, the industry kind of works as like a swarm. Like you, c you can't if you, I mean, you're only you're supposed to only be as fast as your slowest walker when you're walking in a group. But that's not how this wo this industry works. Like when you have companies like. Um, like Machino that are doing that instant thing. The second yeah. you've the second you've shown it, you can buy it. Like it's very hard to like not. We're walking as fast as the fastest yeah. walker, aren't we? Yeah, we are. We we, we are. Yeah. Like, and and that's a really dangerous game to play when you have people like, well, when you have have brands that aren't yeah like the soft creatives. It's yeah. it's a really hard pressure to to be to be trying to keep up with. Mm. And is it harming design? As yeah, well as of course it is, yeah. of course, hundred yeah. percent, undoubtedly. Mm. So what's the answer? Because there's, there's some interesting solutions. You know, there's a lot talked about. We talked about it on the product panel because we talked about gender. About maybe it would make sense to have things like men's and women's showing together, and which seems like quite a novel idea. I think if you suggested that about two years ago, everyone would look at you like you were nuts. Whereas now it actually cuts down scheduling issues, and it seems like design-wise and aesthetically and socially to make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Is that a solution? What are the other solutions? I, I think there are a lot of solutions and I think they are going to start coming through because as you said, it's so detrimental mm. to design and yet as people we, we, we want to find ways to, to, to be imaginative and creative. So I, I think something like showing differently and showing men's and women's together, I think being able to have some businesses that are small as well and realising that this, this notion of success is lots of different things, it isn't just about money, but being able to do that in a city like London is really tricky because you can't sort of take yourself out of the system because you've still got to pay rent or buy a house or whatever. So yeah. um, it, I, I think it's quite interesting to see what designers are doing in other locations as well, other mm. than the big major cities. Uh, and you go to places that maybe have a different pace of life and you look at the way that things are created. In some incredible, exquisite, amazing things are going on in the world, being made in various different places that we don't necessarily know about. Mm. So just because we don't see it on, on the runway doesn't mean to say there's not really amazing things going on. Mm. Mm. I mean, I, I would cite designers like, I mean, I agree absolutely with this. I think there is going to be, going forward, talking about sustainability, a movement for much more smaller niche people who are actually changing their lifestyle. If you look mm. at people, uh, designers like Paul Harden, mm. who is in menswear, you know, He's in all the right shops that he should be in. He just makes enough clothes. Nobody, you can't Google him. You, you won't find mm. a picture of him. He, do, he, you know, there's nothing about him on the net. But he has touch woods. <laughs> I don't know if I'm telling the truth. But a great business, mm. really well respected. It's small. People who buy his clothes love his clothes and have a you know a long-lasting relationship mm. with them. And you know the the kind of lots of the really cool shops. Mm. have his stuff and it's mm. not it's it's not big glitzy glamour but stuff. I think the problem is that's what fashion measures success and I was thinking a lot about it with you know how we all talk about how we can change this but you think you know the, the way that you change things is when people are young and, and when you're the youngest you can be in our industry which is when you're graduating from like college you're put into this you know you're if, now at LCF as well it used to just be at St Martin's you're taught that you know the biggest thing you should aspire to be is being the big final show that's going to be on Star.com, on Show Studio, on Days, on whoever, and you know be on 
that platform and that that's the ultimate success you're not your success is seen as publicity press and being part of a fashion week system that's what you're I told disagree. Is. do you think I, I think there's a lot of great tutors both at CSM and LCF that are talking to to student designers about all the different things that they might be I think that there is a notion that a lot of, of the students that come come along know that that's the only thing that the industry mm. recognizes them for but I would I mean I I'm sure you can say that, but I, I would say that the way that students are being taught is about the fact that they can do lots of different things and and be recognised in lots of different ways about what being being a fashion designer is. They're not is recognised by your industry. But yeah, but not being recognised by your industry is what people worry about, and it comes back to that whole sort of churn again. Yeah. Of mm. They've got the debt. They've come to college. They're, they're taking three years, so they they really feel more than ever that they've got to kind of make a name for themselves and be mm. visible. Okay. So I, I think that I was going to say we have students who um, either they do get to the press show, but they've made the, all of the garments are completely handmade, but hand stitched, and they are you know they're in the press show because the designs are fabulous, and um, the, the, the their aesthetic, their thought, their what behind it, what's behind it is um, really powerful, and they've gone off to kind of carry on with that. Um, or I know there's an MA student who didn't actually show in the MA show, but will be showing in the MA exhibition, whose work is very, very much about the time it's taken mm. to make, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't ready for the the show because it, it, there's so much handwork mm. involved. But it will make the most fabulous showpiece at the exhibition, mm. you know, and he'll go off to, to be an art, you know, to be an artist. Mm. Where where will he go off to be an artist? In, uh, Japan. Japan. But I think that that's, that's the great amazing thing about fashion is that there's lots of different ways of, of being amazingly creative and it might be that you go off and do something like that or you might be, I mean some of our students work, you know we've got work with prisons and working with, mm. with people in prisons that they can see how they can share their skills with other people and, and delight other people and make other people feel great. Mm. So they might never be heard of on the on sort of the, the, the sort of fashion mainstream but it doesn't mean that they haven't been successful as designers mm. um, and I think that there has to always be great stars that do something in the way that Galliano is and in the way that Margiela <laughs> uh, the, the sort of background mm. of it and both of those things are very different facets of fashion both mm. really important but is it a media issue then because you know as you say those people aren't reported on but I would say you know why aren't they then reported on why is it the case that you know we report tirelessly on the shows but we don't on people even it's got to the point where people don't do presentations. <laughs> That's the reason. Yeah. Because, you know, that... The, the, they'll, be the, never, they'll never the, be paying advertising. The, yeah. uh, and the parties and the, the, the wine that flows or the beautiful canapes that you want to talk about and the wonderful celebrities uh, all revolve around the money. And, and if you're going to do that, you've got to be making money in order to pay the money to get the press interested. But do you not think it's a bit defeatist to not be trying to get them into... I mean, I, I'm saying that and actually it's, that's ridiculous because I don't even think the industry is going to... I think that we'll probably see some sort of like crash of some description. I do think there will be a change because I don't think it's sustainable. No, it's definitely it's not working. sustainable. But do you not think that it's a bit... It's almost a bit sad that you're, that, that you're, you're having to teach them that in these other directions? I, I think that... No? Um, what we have to teach them yeah. is resilience, <laughs> resilience and to be really flexible and to mm. use their creative imaginations, mm. which is what we're growing, mm. to solve a myriad of problems and issues mm. which will be coming our way in the next mm. five years, ten because years and twenty years, which will completely change yeah. the, the way that, mm. you know, kind of business operates yeah. and big business operates and we've, we've got to instill in them a, a really strong kind of ambition to be to to be kind of and do you think that's because you're teaching too many students and there's not enough places within the industry yeah ethically that's tricky isn't it because what we're saying the criticism of the industry like too many shows too much pay because wouldn't it be nicer if you were teaching enough students for to go into the industry i just think the industry is going to change yeah, yeah i think so I too I, but I, and I, I don't think we're teaching too many because lots of them go into lots of you know mm. some of them go mm. purely yeah. into design loads of them use the, yeah. the the thought processes to go into you know and to 
go into it loads of different... teaching. Like, I don't do anywhere near as much teaching as you do, but I lecture at you know St Martin's and LCF occasion. And I stand there, and sometimes it is really demoralising because you stand there in front of a select like a group of students, and you know that they will not all get jobs in this industry, and you feel like you're lying to them because you know like the. There's journalism students like forty a year, you know. But that's same with that's same with new gen candidates. They're same with like yeah. fashionese candidates. There's but if that's starting like, at college, yeah, if no. you're going to, you know, it's, it's not going to change. It's all good us saying, you know, oh, you know, there's too many designers being pushed through the schedule and being encouraged to set up their own label. But I go, yeah, but if you've got a year of you know, sixty designers at each art school, then. But I do think that um, I mean, we we had a, a a big talk last night talking about manifestos and what they stood for and something that came up was this notion of actually design skills change the world not always by making collections but mm. um, W.E. Bateson said that um, the world comes to be as it is imagined mm. so if you do need people who can imagine something that's different from what exists yeah. so a, a fashion designer might come out of college and have great ideas that they can apply to working in quite a different industry and quite a different sphere. Mm. And working in, in the area of design sustainability, I find myself working with people at the Met Office, people in the psychology department at Sheffield mm. University, different people, and, and I get inspired by working with different disciplines. Mm. The other disciplines kind of get something from working with us as designers. So I don't think that unless you, you have got this trajectory of you're learning particular skills and you apply it in a particular way, that you've, you've, you've failed or you've sold mm. out. Mm. I think you absolutely need iconic designers that, that are making amazing things for us all to wear, but I don't think that if we are also teaching people to, as, as you said, resilience, this notion of being able to use creativity in a lot of ways. We need designers to do other things other than make But do you clothes. find you're having to manage a lot of expectations and kind of say to students, because my impression, and I think, you know, talking Because surely they grew up looking at the Galliano's yeah, and the McQueen's. Exactly. Like, surely that's what the things that inspired them to get into this industry. So you must be trying, not, you must be trying to find different paths for Sometimes. Them. I think sometimes people come onto the course because they love the process of making and, and, and doing different things and being actively involved in changing things. And I and, and think some students actually find themselves that they say, you know what? I'm not as good at pattern cutting as I thought I might be, but I've realised I'm actually really good at getting people to do things in ways that, 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 that is, is it more experimental or do something in the public arena. Or, and, and I think people find, if you keep it open, they realise that, that, that although they didn't necessarily achieve the thing that they thought they wanted to achieve, that, that should be what university is for, yeah. Yeah, finding the thing that you didn't even know that you were good at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm a jewellery designer and I stupidly put myself into the hamster wheel of doom and yeah. quickly realised that actually it's not a very pleasant place to be. No. As much as I like grew up admiring th these incredible designers and then quickly, like two years into doing my first collection, like watched yeah. them fall. Yeah, it's terrifying. So but it's what made you put yourself into it? I'm just interested. Oh, what, was it the advice you were given? Was it the people no, no, you no, observed? No, 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 no. I, I studied in a course where like you were taught to like, I don't know, wrap a turnip in silver that's that's quite dismissive <laughs> it was like more more craft and more yeah. like conceptual like jewelry like yeah. it's art based it was it was not i was never taught anything about fashion mm. but you must have, I, mean, I was but i was in my external life i was putting myself in there as like and i think you yeah, kind of do the thing that you know you're capable of and you yeah. know that you can do it well completely i just so wanted to make jewelry that is, was beautiful you know that you can and also, I wanted to show because no one was doing jewelry at that time that was trying to keep up with fashion. Like mm. no one was doing collections at that pace, and mm. I just wanted to show that you could be that creative. You that, can do that, right? even if it's not something that is sustainable for the rest of my life. Yeah, I mean, I'm always astounded by maybe meeting up with some graduates who are three or four years graduated, and people are in the most amazing positions. And I, if you'd said to me, okay, out of that year, who's going there and then, mm. I would never have put them in there. You know, they mm. might have no context, they might have no, it, no kind of special treatment from anybody, and somehow luck has shined on them, and they've had a friend, or they've mm. met somebody, or they've just been in the right place at the right time, they've got a fantastic job, and they're doing everything I thought they couldn't do. Mm. You know, because they'd never proved it on the course. Mm. So I'm, I'm really reluctant to kind of judge where they might go or who they, what they might become. Because quite often I, I'm really surprised 
mm. by who and, and, and where they are and what they're doing and how all the things that I said when they left, you know, kind of, oh, this is what you've got to do. They've, they've kind of just grown wings and flown off. Mm. It's hard, though. I do think it's, it kind of goes back to what I was asking about the media scrutiny of designers. I do think this notion of success is measured in a very, very narrow way. Mm. Mm. And, and as a city hard. in particular, we do have this, this like, w- within the media of hype. Yeah. And hype is like a drug when you're a designer. Like it's like, you, it, it it's really like a strange thing to be thrown upon you. Yeah. Like, yeah. And maybe that could, in terms of media scrutiny, I don't know whether that's scrutiny, but it's definitely a, not necessarily a positive thing mm. to be throwing at a designer. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Dean? You kind of nodded then briefly. Um, I think fashion's kind of about hype, though, isn't it? And it's about, I mean, I know it's not just about these things, but like I like the glitz and the glamour and the kind of unrelentingness and the the nastiness of it, the kind of obsession with hype. Yeah. That's kind of what appeals to me in a way. But it is like hype so intrinsic Mm. to this industry more than other. Although I I think some people can thrive on it. It's funny, um, hype or or pressure or being pushed, you know, it's, it's the same, I think, in lots of industries. I saw whiplash this week. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really interesting to see how you know you push one person, yeah. keep pushing, push, keep pushing, or keep telling them they can't do it, mm. and it makes them more determined. Yeah. And I think it's the same in fashion. You know, some people are going to be able to really deal with that mm. and deal with the hype and deal mm. with the pressure, and other other people can't. So I don't I don't think there's a sort of blanket. It does. It's it's every, It's bad for everybody. But I do think it is bad for everyone because I think the concept we're talking about with designers, you know, the pace and them being under this relentless pressure. It's kind of had this trickle down effect on the industry where now I'm not saying it's as bad for journalists as it is for de- designers, but everyone is working to this relentless pace where, you know, like I spend like two months of my year in hotels and like mm-hmm. I don't even cover the women's wear and the men's wear because I would find it unsustainable as a human, but there are a lot of, lot of mm-hmm. journalists who do. So it means that you've got like a whole industry that's f- almost constantly on the move, like flying around the world. And it's that's a relatively new thing. Yeah, it is. It's, a and it's new and thing. it's and it's not slowing down. But like. it's filtered down even more. See so that that kind of that happened with the journalists, and that affected the stylists and the makeup artists and all the people that go into producing a show. And then I think it filtered down to this point where we've built a fully unsustainable industry where there's magazines where people aren't paid anything. You know, whole mm. magazines where no one gets paid or operate with one paid member of staff and 20 interns. And but I think the people who, bonkers. who thrive on it aren't the people who actually work at that speed. They're the ones that kind of do it un- in their own terms. Yeah. And then you can, you can kind like of... Like who? Survive. Like who? <laughs> um, <laughs> sounds like Phoebe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it's certainly certain not not saying that it's easy for her or that she, you know. Mm. I just think uh, it's really hard. I think the industry has lost its kind of like codes of practice because there's not time to implement them. So nothing's like regulated or checked properly, and there's no kind of sense of like. And 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 yeah, the more it goes on, like in terms of for especially from a designer's point of view, like you you the the more it goes on, the more. You're you're just only involved with your industry. Yeah. Like your friends become the the people that are in that rat race, and you. Yeah. And it's it's very insular. Mm. And you don't have time to consuming. look at anything. Which going back to be a designer, like the most important thing is to like walk around. Look which at is why when you get someone like John who's having a fall, like it's why it's so easy for it to go unnoticed because everyone is is so caught up in their own yeah. their own <laughs> business, and there's not enough real friends for him to be checking in on him. Yeah. Because they all have a. A, an a, a, a pound, pound to make off his flesh. I think, as you say, though, I think it will crash. I think human nature is that we do actually in love relationships. We love things that, that are not just about speed and adrenaline. And we've become so adrenaline obsessed uh, that at some point the adrenaline will stop kind of giving us a rush. And we'll I just think you can't have an industry that works on unsustainable work hours and no money. I just can't see it continue. I think it will. There's so many magazines that won't be able to continue functioning, and there's so many kind of, you know, people who can't operate without having like three unpaid assistants, and it's it's just I just think it's a really bizarre industry, and it's kind of. I went to a Susie Menkes talk recently, Did you? which Sounds was fan- great. It was fantastic, yeah. But she was talking about. I, I'm sure she was talking about John Galliano, but if I misremember, I apologise. But she was talking about how he did a collection and he wanted to do something like India, so he went away to India for three weeks 
God knows what he got up to there, but like went away to <laughs> India and kind of experienced, went out, did all this stuff, researched, like embraced it. And she's saying just how that would be impossible these days. You know, you wouldn't get. Mm. Sounds like yeah, yeah, Kim, Jones. Kim, <laughs> Kim Kim's Jones. forever on it, on <laughs> yeah. a, on an adventure. <laughs> a in some is always. Like I think that's something he's really fought for. He's really fought. He's for really it. fought so for. So how it. does he operate then? He just travels around. Well, he's oh, he's he's he obsessed is, with nature and he's obsessed with with traveling and that's that's constantly. his that's his. Crop. But it does mean he is so busy. Yeah. Like you never see him. He never has actual downtime. He has no traveling downtime. downtime. He like, has <laughs> like he has adventures in Africa and yeah, well, Paraguay. When God we've hung out, well. I've hung out with him at lunch at the Eurostar terminal. When yeah. He was going to get Eurostar, and I went to his house after the Beaton show. Yeah. It's like that's how it works if you want to see him. Yeah. Like he's not like, and they are researched for Beaton collections. It's not like yeah. he's having a jolly like you know he'll. But I think yeah, you're right. You have to really. But also he has got one of the the houses with the most money behind him, so they can kind of facilitate. If you're like a young London designer. You're doing your books, you're doing your accounts, you're doing... And he ties, it in, he like ties it in with the advertising, they exactly. do the shoots out of there and like mm. and flies Alistair Mackey. And yeah, but they, you can't do that like, title if you're a young designer. You can't, you know, just, often you don't have a PR, you don't have a social media strategist, you don't have anyone doing your accounts. You can't be like, oh, I'll put that on hold and go to Guadeloupe and have a look. Mm. Should we see what John Galliano <laughs> did for this season? Then we'll go to our final topic, which is deconstructionism after. I'm going to ask what you think to this quite early on because I'm interested about the, the marriage of what we were talking about before with the two aesthetics. Can you see any more than the first three? Yeah, we can keep scrolling. Mm -hmm. I have this issue with how people are analysing Margiela though because I think people have got obsessed with this idea that Margiela is minimal and clean. Mm -hmm. Which I actually don't it's think it is yeah. at all. It's, it's not. Is it? No, it's not. But it's, got, it's become a real. But I think particularly if you if you see a lot of um, not I really don't mean this in a patronising way, like young people who were tweeting about the Margiela collection. Like particularly, I was looking at some like fashion students and blogs, that are, like really sort of young writers, and not that they're ill-informed, but I think to them Margiela is minimal. It's like white paint, clean, and I do think it'll be interesting to see how he manages to show people another side of Margiela. Like you know, like number five. I'm taking that as it looks like it's a tie, you know, like a silk tie reinterpreted, which is, you know, quite an opulent thing that Margiela did, which yeah, was taking yeah, lots of ties and, and, and making lots of, and cloaks. And things. I like number seven. Yeah, it's the first, it's the first one I really like. It's like me walking home after <laughs> night out with my <laughs> clutch bag, bag of KFC, bag. Of KFC. <laughs> <laughs> lots of very different looks, actually, aren't there? Apparently there was a mixture with the models where some were kind of walking, you can kind of see this with, six, uh, with seven, eight and nine, and some were kind of acting. I presume seven is acting. acting. Yeah, well, I like the acting. <laughs> yeah, so they were kind of doing a stalking walk. Oh, and ten. Hands in there. <laughs> you see that, I, yeah, I, I like that because there's a sense of sort of quirkiness in there. Yeah. Um, whereas I think, I don't know, so, so far I'm, I'm, I'm still seeing it as a transition. <laughs> I'll let somebody else comment first. Dean, what do you think? <laughs> She's sassy, number yeah. 12. Yeah, 12. I like her. 7, 10 and 12 are my faves so far. Yeah. But I think it's an interesting... But they have a really strong <laughs> like sense of Galliano. The slightly mental ones. Yeah. They, do, they do have a really strong sense of Galliano. Yeah, the theatre's there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I like the colours. I, like, I, I, th I think it looks quite modern and on, mm. like, up to date. No, I do like, like the colours. Seventies and eighties colour palettes, mm. and those the bright, the bright ones cutting through. I think also the shapes; it's quite sensual, which I like because my issue with the couture, I did think it was very intriguing. I actually liked it a lot, but and, I, and it sounds very, very critical. I did feel it looked a bit dated. I think yeah. it, it did look. It didn't a, look modern. Didn't look modern. Mm, I think no. that was another smart mm. thing with them not showing alongside the other couture yeah. shows because I think that even more so if you'd have put it against like wraps and this tied hair. That's quite like. Um, medium catch off hair reference. Yeah, that is very today. true. It's very medium catch off. Very though. medium catch off. Mm. Mm. But then Ben Kirchhoff styles Margiela menswear. I okay, don't know so if maybe it's I don't know if he's continuing doing that, but okay. he did for a while. I don't know if anyone's allowed to know that. Anyways. <laughs> 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 they do now. <laughs> um, yeah, I, did, I think strange. it does look modern. Yeah, the, the shoe, um, Andrew Davis this morning talked about the shoes at yeah, Gucci. They love, they love, there's a hairy for, shoe moment. Yeah, right he now, said it's like you're <laughs> kicking a wig down the runway. Yeah, <laughs> and that's very much that, isn't it? 
I do like the... Um, I think what's interesting, though, because the reason I want to talk about deconstructions and later is I do think that notion of being kind of like... Um, tattily dressed or deliberately sort of waywardly dressed just feels really modern if you look at the labels that people are really enjoying at the moment you know at the kind of real kind of considered end you have uh, Marcus Almeida who really kind of like thrive on that and that's what they do but even someone like Simone Rocher it's kind of slightly this slightly scruffy look mm -hmm. and I think that it's interesting because I do think it, it makes this feel really modern because the whole Margiela thing of your clothes being a little bit ripped and kind of falling off and made from old things that just feels really current mm -hmm. so I think it's kind of you, you it, not that it's kind of like, oh, it inevitably feels modern, but I think you would have had to work hard for it not to feel like the time is never going to be better for Margiela to be doing that aesthetic. Mm. Yeah, completely. I think this, well, I mean, I, I'm no journalist, but uh, it, it, to me, it looks like it sits well, nicely with what else is going on right now. Mm. It, doesn't, mm. it doesn't feel out of mm. place with other things that I've seen mm. from this season. Mm. But it, doesn't, it doesn't look that much like anything else, does it? Well, no, no but I mean I can't. No, no but, but like I mean, I'm not saying that just means it, it, it's quite unique yeah. in a way. Mm. I don't see it and instantly think of like, oh, this collection, that collection. Mm. Mm. And I really like the characters. Yeah. I think I think that's a really nice way of showing because he's getting a little bit of expression out, but mm. the rest of it is running like a really lost twenty-eight foot. Show. Yeah, the characters are fab, yeah, and, they, and they do feel like a new yeah. sense of Galliano. Mm. That, the number twenty-seven, the one before that, that looked like a mm. velvet um, suit, the trousers and the top. Mm. It, it was as if it was—I um, don't know—it was embroidered. Mm. Was about twenty-one or nine, uh, and twenty-four is fab as well. Mm. Um, mm. And you kind of feel as if this is a new, new, new sense of Galliano. Um, but they're kind of dotted there, they're the number 21, yeah. I think that's mm. fab. There's a lot of his codes in there, though, like the pinstripe, the bias cut, mm. kind of slip dresses, like the tailoring and the very sharp kind of corsetry and, and, the, and the sort of tux jackets which he's doing. And but I just think he's being so tirelessly referenced. I've been thinking a lot about this because of the Bosacci collection, which um, is actually a point Alex Fury made, which is really smart, which it was, and a lot of people have said actually it's this, looked like she'd designed a collection inspired by people ripping off Versace. So it's like she'd looked at how people <laughs> copied Versace and then kind of Amazing. copied them. Amazing. Which, uh, which it kind of was, which I think partly you could say that's part of the Anthony Vassalio appointment, like she's looking at Versace mm. through his eyes. And I kind of think it's the same for Galliano because I think, you know, that 90s thing is being so tirelessly referenced. Yeah. And this, I'm not saying it is referencing that, but it just feels very topical. It feels very timely. Like I'm looking at this and I am seeing Medium Kirchhoff. Yeah, I'm seeing Medium Kirchhoff too. A lot, but I've also seen Marcus Almeida, and I don't yeah. think I'm 99% sure he's not sat and trawled through Marcus Almeida collections and copied them. But there are full looks off this that if you said, Oh, that was last season, Marcus Almeida, mm -hmm. it looks like exactly the same aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But then, does it feel Margella? I mean, you've got things like the dressmaker's dummy bodices, sorry, Brett, can you go to number 15, which he did yeah. with the couture, which is obviously a reference, and that kind of like the, the way he's made 15, mm -hmm. like the shape of that is a dressmaker's dummy, mm -hmm. but then the detailing on her sort of. I guess it's a bodysuit or tights and a tight top make her look like a dummy, which yeah. is obviously a Margiela reference. Um, but is, is there enough Margiela in there? And the sequin dresses, which Margiela did printed. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Which goes back to what we were saying about Margiela being opulent. And I think that's what's exciting about it. Is I hope people don't kind of immediately dismiss it as not being... I'm not saying this is what you were doing, Dennis, but I think a lot of people have been like, oh, you know, he's opulent and Margiela's not. And actually... I, I think it's really exciting to kind of for people to be educated about the Margiela archive because it is amazing and so mm. diverse and, mm. and you can't really find a lot of it online which is kind of an interesting thing and I think mm. part of this notion of Margiela being all white has come from just the availability of imagery that is all white rather than the earlier stuff. I don't think in the I mean in the in the relatively recent one Margiela collections that have been like they had those like sequined masks mm. and mm. colors and stuff. Mm. Yeah, and the, and the couture has always been really colourful and ornate mm. and, and lots of different um, textures together. Mm. I like it, the idea of kind of things found. I think that's quite interesting because I know that's a very Margiela thing of like taking things and and um, turning them into something else. But it seems like the aesthetic of, of if he's presenting to a woman a proposition for getting dressed, it seems to be to get dressed with that kind of man that in your mind of like take things from all different parts of your wardrobe and throw them together. And that I think that that's quite nice because his not that his work's called laboured, but it's never really felt particularly kind of eclectic in terms of like mixing day wear and, and night, mm. to me, recently. But I think what you were saying about Galliano's going to come back, and actually some of those, for me, just feel like Galliano's come back and it almost doesn't need to reference 
Maison Martin Margiela, it's kind of, it's, it's exciting to see mm. Galliano doing something. Um, mm. And, and that from, uh, the ones that I like are the ones where it feels like it's, it's a new sense of Galliano rather than it's Galliano doing Margiela. Mm. <laughs> but do you, do you think that it doesn't feel Margiela then? Was that Margiela is quite serious, isn't it? Or is it not? I don't know. I always think of being a serious show. That's like super playful kind of. Yeah, it's very it's cheeky. Theatrical and cheeky show. I think it, but I don't know. I don't, if it, I don't see that as cheeky. I see that like the space is very sterile. It's completely white. I think they're acting, but I don't think there's not that like insolence of the Galliano models where they kind of like got caught up in this character and would like, <coughs> you know, almost flirtatiously come down a runway. I don't think those girls look kind of like, they look kind of, powerful in the way that almost a bit scary you a bit know, mad, I actually. yeah i don't think they look kind of like whimsical and cute but i don't know no depends how they were moving i do like how sensual it is yeah it looks great the whole thing is great it's hard not to get distracted by the hair and the makeup and the yeah. way you're just like mm -hmm. how bright everything is mm -hmm. um they almost don't look like catwalk shots because everyone's so like Mm. Overexposed. It's interesting. He didn't come out for a bow. Everyone apparently was clapping and cheering and screaming, and he didn't mm. come out. Yeah. Oh. Which is quite interesting. I love her. She's my yeah. spirit animal. <laughs> I really love her. her. <laughs> She's fabulous. <laughs> for me, with the white tights, it's got a really a, a little tiny tinge of nineteen early nineteen seventies older sister that everyone used to look up to and want to mm. be kind of. Mm. She's a character, isn't she? I, what I like about it is, you know, that, that Dean, you were saying that kind of the time is right for like narrative fashion. Everyone's obsessed with that, but I think it's hard to do that in a way that feels new. And I, what I like about this is, it, it doesn't seem like there's a real fixed story, but the girl is intriguing, but you can't work her out immediately. And I think that's quite interesting. You know, a lot of the, the really narrative shows, like I love how Medium Kirchhoff did narrative, and I guess how kind of Ryan Lola's narrative, but the narrative is very clear immediately. You're like, right, it's about this girl, and this is her story this season. Whereas much harder to get that from her. Like she's kind of summing up. She's a bit like, don't ask about me. You don't know. Like, I like her. Yeah, I like her That's as well. Great. Yeah. And I like the fact that the, 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 these characters that kind of are highlighted and, and some of the other parts of the show are, are quite uh -huh. different. And so the narrative is, is intriguing because it's not just one narrative. Yeah, exactly. It's a com it's complex. Can we go back to the girl in the gloves? I love her because she looks like someone's rung the door while she was doing the washing <laughs> yeah. up. And she's like, what do you want? And she's got her marionettes. <laughs> It's very cute. Is it what we're expecting? Not for me. What were you expecting? It's great. Well, it's just, I don't know, but it is. I mean, it's not that like the Couture show no. in a way. It no, makes it makes the Couture show seem even better. I think it's just like the breadth of ideas. Yeah. The number of collections. It's much more useful. Um, I think the mm. Couture show didn't seem as about an age group, whereas this really feels like it's about young women. Yeah. To me, it makes me understand the couture show a lot less I don't yeah does it yeah I don't because uh, that seemed like such a defined like s statement and this has nothing to do with that. it that the couture show for me was like the um, orchestra tuning up before mm -hmm. they go into the overture you know it was that big noise that you get mm -hmm. of everybody yeah. clearing mm -hmm. everything you know that was it and now he's kind of making his statement Okay. I do think it's interesting that he had those the twirls in the couture show because I think that was a statement that that was a work in progress and it was about things being made and I think it kind of yeah I think he was trying to say that it wasn't a definitive statement by doing that it was kind of it was a work in progress when did he actually start there he started there he got appointed in late 2014 so he didn't have that much time no time no, yeah. no. Yeah. like the menswear that we saw the Margiela menswear he wasn't involved in um, even after his appointment. Actually, I didn't realise it was that. Yes. Yeah, it was really short. But was that when they announced it or was that when he literally started? It was, that was when they announced yeah. it, so you're not sure. But then if you think Raph Simmons did his first Dior Couture show in eight weeks, so yeah. I don't think people would be like... Yeah. And what does this, you know, the last topic that I wanted to talk about was sort of deconstructionism. Does this, is this kind of a new version of that? You know, because I think it's interesting because it is something that you associate with the House of Margiela. <laughs> And I think it's something that's kind of tirelessly, I think, not being copied, but it's a spirit that's in the air. And I just wonder, 
Is it something that still feels relevant and interesting? Who are the masters of it? Com, obviously. Yeah, and I think Marcus Almeida for the new mm. talent is, is really championing that and doing mm. it well. Mm. Does it still feel current though? Or does it feel a bit weird to see it, going back to what we're talking about with the system where you're turning out so many collections, is there an almost an irony to seeing like pre-frayed stuff and that kind of thing? I mean, I think Com is just exquisite and I, and I think the way that, that she does that is amazing. But it, it's, it's funny when, when, you, when we, the question came around about deconstructionism and I thought, if you think back to Christopher, Christopher Nemeth in the yeah. 80s and then the fact that he was selling in Kensington Market and then we've got Com in Dover Street Market that was kind of drawing on the idea of Kensington, Street, Kensington yeah. Market. Um, and now Christopher Nemeth's the inspiration for a Louis Vuitton collection as well. It's all <laughs> gone very bonkers, hasn't it? It is quite bonkers. Um, oh. What? <laughs> it's a crazy shoe. Yeah, yeah, it's a cute shoe. Cool. And you've got John Junior, which mm. is always, you know, and, and Sakai. Mm. I think you Sakai's know. really, really interesting because it's very kind of, it feels very, because obviously she was pattern cutter for um, Ray Kawakubo, and I think she, there's that luxury there. It feels very, it's kind of like a modern version of it because it does feel quite ornate and it's really wearable. I think that's the thing. That shoe, was it an elastic band around the ankle and then the, sha- the strap was undone? Can you go back to it? It looks like the strap's oh, broken yeah. and she's got an elastic band. <laughs> but that's a little bit more marginal. It's deconstructed. It's deconstructed as much as best, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so are we fans of what we've seen? Yeah, I think it's a good collection. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I really love good. it. Yeah, it's great, man. I just think she's an interesting character, and I do think it feels really, really relevant. And I, I, I think the fact that when I say it looks like the, the things we're seeing in London, I don't mean that in a criticism. I mean it looks like current and exciting. And I really like the mix of high and low. Like even just in that look, you kind of see it like the kind of the feathers and the the real kind of evening stuff with really, really. I just think that feels really exciting and. No one's mixing stuff that well amongst the big brands, I don't think. It's kind of a very, it's remained a London thing. I really want those shoes. Yeah, and there's lots of ideas in just one collection, mm. which is always good. And are we happy he didn't come out? His, his span of mystery. I think it's fair enough. I always I quite like to see him, he's quite a funny looking chap. Like, <laughs> you, wanna, <laughs> you know, yeah, you want to see what he does at the end of the show, definitely. I'm sure he'll be back out on the catwalk. Maybe that was his great piece of theatre, was not showing up. I'd, I'd like to say, but not in the white coat, I thought it looked a bit weird at the end. I don't of think the it's necessary for him to make it about him. We all know it's him. Do you know yeah. what I mean? He doesn't need a, a cheer. Or a yeah. And maybe that is a statement. I think that is obviously a statement that yeah. he doesn't come out. That's a big statement. Yeah, of course. Well, shall we give him, even though he's hiding away, <laughs> a clap to round yeah. things off? <laughs> 